Hello and welcome to the, uh, the third and final video in this short series uh, which I've prepared for the people of St Joseph Bromley. Um, many thanks to Father Peter Murphy for the invitation to, to share this with you. And in these three videos I've been looking at various aspects of Anglican identity. Uh, we've so far considered Anglicanism as a national and international phenomenon. Um, we've looked at this parish here, the parish of St George Bickley, where I'm the vicar. And um, in this uh, final video I'm going to say a little bit about my own ministry as a priest and my own vocation. So, so my name is Father Richard Norman, the Vicar of St George's Bickley, and in this final video a little bit about my own uh, journey in ministry to date. Um, so uh, to begin with a, a slightly sort of potted uh, biographical history, um, I um, didn't grow up in a, a practicing Christian family and we perhaps went to church at Christmas time um, uh, or on other occasions, but really my first um, exposure to, to religious belief and practice and uh, the way in which I became a Christian was through the example of friends who attended uh, a local church youth group um, and uh, going on holiday camps with them uh, and things like that. And I came to faith in my, my early teens. Um, and the, the church that ran that youth group was in the evangelical tradition of the, the Church of England. So you may remember in my first video I spoke about how there's such diversity and variety in the Church of England. And the, the evangelical churches tend to be larger churches, uh, better resourced churches, and um, for reason of that, um, likely to have the most developed youth ministries as well. And so I was able to uh, uh, to avail myself of, of, of that provision. And I'm very grateful in retrospect to have seen something of that uh, variety within the church and hopefully to have um, imbibed some of the the treasures and the riches that come from each tradition uh, that make up the Church of England overall. Um, so uh, I wish that I could um, pinpoint um, the, the precise moment at which I then felt some stirring of vocation to, to ministry, to being a priest, but I can't really find the exact moment at which it occurred. Uh, there was no sort of bolt of lightning or, or voice out of heaven, uh, no road to Damascus moment. Instead, I think it was something that came upon me quite gradually. And um, really what made me take it seriously was the fact that it didn't go away. And I think that uh, when we're discerning vocation, whoever we are and whatever we're called to do, one of the uh, most important characteristics of a, of a genuine vocation, authentic vocation, is its persistence, uh, the fact that it does remain with us, particularly as our lives change. And if you think about in your early teenage years, you're going through a lot of changes, um, including changes of schooling, school university, uh, so on and so forth. And um, uh, throughout all of that, my, my sense of... Uh, vocation of, of exploring and responding to that call remain with me and so I, I um, took it seriously uh, because of that. Um, and it was whilst I was at university I went to, to Oxford and I read philosophy and theology at Oxford as an undergraduate. It was whilst I was there that I um, was uh, selected for, for ordination training. Um, I think our system is probably quite similar to yours in that um, somebody who feels a sense of vocation has to um, put that before the church for it to be tested. Um, and so there are references to be written, interviews to be had, and there's a residential selection conference uh, that one participates in. And a, a recommendation either to, to put someone forward for training or not is, is given to the bishop. And fortunately, in my case, the recommendation was that I should uh, carry on to the next step. Um, Incidentally, it was also whilst I was at university that I had my first experience of worshipping in a community of people who were largely my age. Um, parishes are, are wonderful places um, and there's great variety of ages and backgrounds in parishes, but on the whole, um, there are fewer younger people than there are in, in their older years. And so it was quite a revelation for me, having only known parish backgrounds previously, uh, then to worship more in a chaplaincy environment. And the chaplaincy to which I belonged was um, somewhere called Pusey House in Oxford, um, in the, the Anglo-Catholic tradition of the church. And it was um, uh, a very significant part of my life and my growth in faith um, to worship alongside other young Christians who took their faith seriously, uh, but not, um, not particularly somberly. I was impressed by both by the strength of the spiritual life and of the social life that was on offer uh, each year. Just before Easter, we would go away to um, uh, 
uh, a place called Ascot Priory for a residential retreat between Maundy Thursday and um, Easter Day. And uh, I think one of the, the defining images that I remember from, from that period um, was on Holy Saturday seeing lines of penitents outside the um, studies of the three priests who accompanied us, um, penitents waking, waiting to make their confessions, um, and seeing those, those lines of young people uh, doing so was, was um, uh, very impressive uh, uh, to my mind. Um, so a little plug, of course, as we approach um, the great celebration of Easter and Holy Week, um, which is that if you haven't yet made your confession, um, uh, or it's been a little while since since you, you've done so, um, what a wonderful opportunity to avail yourself of that uh, great outpouring of God's love and mercy in the Sacrament of Reconciliation. Uh, so do, do go to confession before Easter if you haven't done so so far. As I say, I was um, recommended for, for training for the priesthood whilst I was at university, and so after I completed my first degree, I um, began at an Anglican theological college, a seminary, um, and in a very different environment to one that I'd known, the ones that I've known uh, to date, um, because I moved up to West Yorkshire, um, to a place called Murfield, which is a small town outside Huddersfield, near Leeds, and there is an Anglican theological college there called the College of the Resurrection. And the College of the Resurrection in Murfield shares its campus with an Anglican religious community. It's something of a surprise to people sometimes to um, know that the Church of England has monks and nuns uh, and has religious, um, obviously far fewer in number than in the Roman Catholic Church, but they are there. And the community at Murfield is a, a male community uh, called the Community of the Resurrection. And um, they began life in the... Uh, in the 19th century as um, really a company of mission priests, uh, missions at home and missions abroad, including in South Africa. Um, they set up theological colleges and other education establishments there. Um, you may have heard the name uh, Father Trevor Huddleston, who was a big part of uh, the, the work of the community in South Africa. They trained Archbishop Desmond Tutu, um, another name uh, which may be familiar to you, and they were very active in combating apartheid. And I remember some of the older brothers um, who would sort of sit there in choir looking sort of rather meek and humble had actually been arrested and put in prison uh, in their youth for opposing apartheid um, uh, and had been um, uh, caught up in the, the state's uh, response to that. Um, as the community has grown older and grown smaller in number, uh, the, the charism, the character of the community has changed uh, a little bit and they have become more contemplative, um, more residentiary, uh, and so their, their work now is welcoming retreatants, um, welcoming uh, guests to come and stay in the, the monastery, and obviously sharing um, their liturgical life with us, the students who were there in the college. And it was a, a wonderful thing to be able to worship day by day alongside this community who had given their lives over uh, to prayer and contemplation. I think that was one of the, uh, the big things that I took from that time. Um, one of the differences, I think it's a difference between our, our systems, is that in the Church of England, um, we spend a comparatively short time at uh, Theological College. Because I'd uh, studied theology and philosophy before for three years, um, I then had only two more years at um, Theological College. Um, uh, one of the other reasons why we, we spend such a short time at Theological College is because a large part of our formation um, is understood to take place when you leave Theological College and go into what's called your title curacy, so when you are an assistant in a parish to begin with, and so we are ordained as deacons at the end of our time at seminary at Theological College, um, just as we begin going into our title curacy, our first parish, and we'll obviously be apprenticed to a more experienced priest, and we'll do a lot of learning on the job, as it were. So I was made deacon in 2011 at the age of 23, which is the youngest canonical age uh, for diaconal ordination in the Church of England, and um, I began serving in a parish at that point, um, and was ordained priest uh, 18 months later in 2012. And the parish in which I was serving at that point was a parish in Bermondsey um, on the River Thames called St Mary Rotherhithe. Very, very um, exciting place to, to serve a curacy, um, a very diverse community, obviously former Docklands, um, sort of heavy industry. Its character had changed, there'd been um, uh, immigration, there'd been uh, regeneration, redevelopment, so you had a lot of different people rubbing shoulders in that place, and the church congregation reflected it, and lots of opportunities for ministry. So uh, I spent three and a half years in Rotherhithe, and I'm um, very grateful for that. And then in 2015, um, I came here to St George Bickley, and I actually began here on my 27th birthday 
um, uh, so it's the 26th of January um, 2015 on my 27th birthday and I was for a short period the youngest beneficed incumbent so the youngest parish priest essentially in the entire Church of England um, it was quite a steep learning curve I think that uh, anyone beginning in a position of such responsibility at the age of uh, 27 has a lot of growing up and catching up to do but I've been here now for for six years and have slightly more idea as to, to what I'm doing and it's a very very different parish of course to to Rotherhithe um, as you'll know it's it's uh, it's an area that's much more residential um, there's far less um, sort of demographic variety some of the challenges are very similar some of them are very different um, and my ministry involves, I, I suppose, many of the things you would imagine that it would do. There are masses to be said here. Um, we have our parish school and there are other schools that I'm involved with. Pre-pandemic, I'd be in the school two or three times a week. Um, now a lot of our provision is happening online. Um, uh, there are other uniformed organisations. I'm chaplain to um, air cadets. I'm involved in school governance. There are all the occasional offices, as we call them, baptisms, weddings, funerals that have to take place. So there's, there's certainly enough to be keeping me busy here at Bickley. Um, and I suppose as I draw towards the close of uh, this session, um, I'll leave you with, with uh, perhaps an unexpected twist to this tale, because um, when Father Murphy asked me to uh, speak to you about the, the life of the Church of England, there was a reason why it might have seemed an, an odd choice, which is that um, vocation, of course, is something that uh, doesn't stop we, we continue to have to listen for the voice of the Lord. And sometimes he calls us to, um, to make some dramatic changes in our lives. And as I've thought and prayed about where I believe God is, is calling and leading me in future, um, perhaps to my surprise and to the surprise of others, uh, the, the, the voice that I've heard has been uh, saying to me that my future in fact lies in the Roman Catholic Church. And so um, after a lot of, of thought and prayer, I'm in fact going to be leaving St George's at the end of April, after we've celebrated St George's Day, and I'll then be received into the full communion of the Catholic Church uh, on the 1st of May, the, uh, the Memorial of St Joseph. And we shall see whether the Church wants to make use of any of the experiences I've had to date uh, in terms of, of, of future priestly ministry. Uh, that's a decision for, for Archbishop John. Um, but perhaps you may be seeing some more of me in, in another context and in another light. But um, thank you very much for, for uh, sharing in this little introduction to the Church of England. And um, thank you for your fellowship and fraternity in the Gospel and in the Church. And I assure you of our prayers for you here at St George's Bickley, and I'd ask your prayers for us. So thank you very much.